What's going on, everybody? My name is Johnny Bannon, and today we have Keenan Aradak here, a former 18 Echo JSOC communicator that's going to talk about a few things. Military transition, how he got his start in IT, and then, of course, a little bit of the history and background of what he did in the military. The main focus today is going to be how we can get service members to transition successfully and Keenan's opinion on how you can be successful in IT, cybersecurity, cloud, or networking. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So what's up, Keenan? Hey, Johnny. How are you, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate the hype. Uh, of course. I had kind of a weird trajectory coming into IT, uh, even weirder getting into the military. But uh, you want me to start with the basics, kind of who's who in the zoo and kind of my yeah, background let's, experience? Let's, let's, get the, let's get the people hype. Let's talk about your background, how you came in as a combat medic, transitioned to special forces, and then you're just branching out into the IT sphere yeah. and how everything went. Yeah, so uh, 2011, uh, March 2011, didn't know what I wanted to do in life, but I knew I wanted to get out of Florida. So uh, I enlisted in as a combat medic. Uh, I was looking at job security. I had just gotten laid off as a, a realtor. Uh, you know, the recession 2009, 2010 was pretty hot at that time. Yeah. So I enlisted in the Army to get away and get a new change of pace. Uh, and so I enlisted, came in, and within the first two months, quickly realized I did not like conventional army, uh, and I needed a change. So uh, two months after being at my first duty station at Fort Campbell, I went to selection. Uh, I was an Arabic-speaking medic. I'm from Syria. Uh, the army, you know, it's it, it emphasizes talent management. So I went from Arabic-speaking medic to Russian-speaking communication sergeant as a Green Beret. So uh, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Maybe it gets better with rank, it doesn't. Uh, so, uh, went to the Q course, no issues, graduated, went to 10th group down in uh, Fort Carson, Colorado. So, I was there for 2014, 2019, uh, served on the same team, 0226 was my detachment, and uh, deployed three times on my team there. And then you come down on the SWIC levy and you got to either find a job or they'll find one for you. So, I assessed and came over to JSOC, did four more deployments from there. I never intended on going and staying in IT. I thought I was going to go to med school. I was studying for my MCAT as late as last year. Took all three years of prereqs and, uh, you know, life changes and life goals will alter. And I was coming up on 35, 36 and the idea of 10, 12 years of my life being restricted again from the service. Just didn't want to do it. So I actually went through Cisco's uh, military and sales and leadership missile MISL. That's the program. It's a skill bridge. Uh, it's offered to all branches. We have Space Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps. We had some Coasties too. Um, it's open to everyone and uh, really fell in love with the culture. Hell yeah. So I want to go back into when you were an 18 Echo. So during yeah. that time as a Green Beret, right? That's a communication sergeant. Correct. How was your view on IT? Were you like, hey, I got these enablers to do it for me. Like, I'm just going to focus on what I need to do as a Green Beret. Yeah, no, I hated the job. Um, <laughs> I almost didn't go to the Q course because I was hoping to be a Delta speaking Arabic. And when they gave me Echo in Russian, I remember I was sitting next to my buddy. He's at first group now thinking, man, I just want to get out now. Screw this. Um, but, you know, I want I came in for a purpose and I wanted to feel fulfilled with my time and uh, I stuck with it. Uh, I never had support or enablers to assist me. Um, so my perspective was, even though I hate it, it's my job. Um, people depend on me. So even if I don't like to do it, I still need to be exceptional at it because people's lives actually count. So I spent hours really trying to figure out and master my craft. Uh, I didn't like it at all. I was always rogering up to be the assistant medic. But uh, when comms are down, you can't get your con ops up. So um, <laughs> I have to get really good at it. Yeah, that ODA commander needs that slides, right? <laughs> you're, you're doing it. You're doing a desk side, and that PowerPoint's got to be pushed <laughs> up over a you know one and a half meg link VSAT. Mm -hmm. So you do what yeah. you can. And yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that because we noticed with a lot of our clients and customers, and you've done some teaching for me that people join the military, they don't always become 18 series, but they're 25 series, and right. they hate the job, and they can't get past that mental hurdle that hey, I'm here now. I need to be exceptional at it. So how do you, if you want to get like give an opinion to everybody, how do you get people past that mentor hurdle and just say, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. It may not be what I want right now, but let me be the best at it. Yeah, your mindset dictates the terms of your situation. So 
if you hate your job and everyone agrees that the circumstances are shit uh, or the situation just is not as a, a healthy working environment as it could be, you can agree to agree on that for as long as you want. But if you remain, if you remain negative and maintain that negative outlook, your situation is not going to improve. Now everyone around you is miserable. Uh, maintaining a really positive outlook because here's the plot twist. In the civilian world, nothing's perfect either. You're going to have adversity. You're going to have bosses you don't like. You're going to have uh, mundane tasks that are tedious and you don't want to do. The only difference is rather than wearing OCPs or whatever your uniform is, there is a prescribed uniform that's actually in the civilian side too. So there's a uniform, a chain of command, there's implied and specified tasks. You're never going to escape that. If anything, it's harder because things aren't as clearly defined on the civilian side. And so really you just have to approach it as, this is my craft, this is what I came in to do. And even if you don't like it, make the best of the, the situation and the circumstance. And if it doesn't play out, and if you get at the end, you, you came in with the right mindset, you maintained your course, and you try to bring up others around you and you still don't like it, then guess what? If you're not in deaf, you can get out. But you really, your attitude's also gonna predicate what people say about you when it comes down to references or recommendations that really plays in or out of your favor. Mm -hmm. And so when you are now getting into kind of your transition, right? Cause again, you've seen it like uh, a lot of soldiers nowadays in the year 2023, they just want to get out and there right. could be multiple reasons for that. There's no war, whatever the case, there's money to be made out there. What do you see as like the biggest pitfall that these soldiers go through? They can't dedicate to certifications. They can't dedicate to training. What is the one thing, if you had to summarize it, that they need to focus on a year or two out from transition? Yeah, so one, he said it at the end, a year to two years out of transition. You really need to determine at a a pretty reasonable point of light, point in your career that like you're done. So if it's two years, it's two years. If it's one year, it's one year. But if you're coming in the window and you're at month two or three, you have no idea what you want to do, and you're just like, hey, you know, I'm just going to go use my GI Bill. That is the wrong approach to use. Um, higher education, uh, if you're going for a bachelor's, master's, or PhD, it's not a panacea. You're not going to find happiness there if you don't know what you're looking for. Hmm. Maybe they're better set for a trade. Maybe a gap year would have been great. Maybe they just missed out on a really exceptional skill bridge program because they didn't look at the, de the datelines or the timelines that are required for your submission. So, hmm. One is to provide you and your family, if you're not single, adequate time to mentally, physically, and financially prepare. And depending on how many deployments you have, uh, spiritually prepare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing I see a lot too with students when we, when we teach them is mm -hmm. not feigning ignorance, but they don't. It seems like they don't know about these programs and what's out there. So I right. tell them, hey, you know, your situation it's determined by you. Google's free, ChatGPT is free and scouring LinkedIn for opportunities for you. So as you started to get out, how did you learn about the Cisco missile program? Was it from your network or was it from you seeking opportunity out? A uh, combination. So I definitely leverage my network to put out feelers to get a feel, get, get an understanding of what was out there and where I would be a best fit. Uh, so as you, kind of get ready for that preparation. The first recommendation I've heard kind of across the board is know where you want to live. This is the first time in your life where you can pick where you want to live. It doesn't have to be forever, but pick where you want to live. Look for the industries and the things that you think would be interesting and then figure it out from there. I knew I wanted to push back out west. I'm not a southern boy. I wanted to go back out to the mountains. Uh, I resourced, I resourced and researched a few of my networks. I made some phone calls. I uh, really got a feel for but between Microsoft, AWS, Amazon proper, Cisco, all across the board, IT, non-IT, project management, I dabbled in anything and everything to get a feel for what I would be a good fit for. And ultimately it was because of my network, but I spent a lot of time researching the position, the company, the corporate values, the culture, uh, things that were important to me. Now, if you, you just need to also determine what is important to you. Is it the culture? Is it the location? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to make a certain income? And you're willing to put that on the back burner. Um, it's really dependent and, you know, military stuff pl at play. It's met TC. It depends on you and you really need to put that on the paper and get it out of your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think the biggest mistake people when they transition is they don't have even a rudimentary plan. They no. just think, Hey, 
Um, I'm gonna get a cert. I got a clearance. I'll be good. But in right. today's job market, it really isn't that simple. You know, it's not the surge. You know, where we had uh, contractors making three hundred grand in Iraq just get, handing them out. You know, nowadays in today's market, especially in IT cybersecurity, I, would you agree that it's super competitive and you have to do things to stand out? One, your network. Two, your personal brand. And then three, your plan. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I'll go ahead backtrack and say this real fast. If you were a bad service member, a bad soldier, you were incompetent, ineffective, uh, no one liked to work with you. That's not going to change when you take the uniform off. So if like the type of person you are at the beginning really predicates what kind of person you're going to be when you get out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if no one wants to work with you, they're not going to want to work with you just because you have a DD-214 in your hand. Mm -hmm. uh, having a clearance is not the only thing. Having a cert is not the only thing. What sets you apart? And so uh, part of my mentorship outreach is I really focus on, and this seems to trip people up, give me your 30 second speech. What makes you different? And mm -hmm. I hear a lot of the standard issue, uh, board presentation, my name is, and they sound like robots, but mm -hmm. outside of serving, and thank you for your service, uh, what value do you bring to the enterprise? What sets you apart? Uh, okay. Why is it that we want to bring you in and uh, assume the risk of having someone that's not as trained or has much time in the industry, but you have something that's special to us and us being in the corporate environment? They just kind of stare at me and you need to have a plan and don't just say, I'm going to go cybersecurity and I'm going to go get a degree from a degree mill because all I need is a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. That is that is factually incorrect. You need to have way more than a piece of paper because you have that paper that gets you a job interview. And guess what? You still have an interview. And you it gets you past the ATS, right? The system that filters, but uh, still doing this human to human. And I think yep. I'm glad you touched on that. So two things that I want to backtrack what you said. How are you different? How do you provide value to organization? I think a lot of times people in the military that mindset they don't currently have. So I have students that are like, hey, I want a good paying job, you know, this, that, and the third. I say, oh, so what are you doing now for your unit? What are you doing now for your organization? Mm -hmm. I think you can agree the reason you've been successful, I've had some moderate success, is because of our name. You know, people may know us and say, oh yeah, that guy was good. So if you're not currently doing that in the military, that's gonna hurt you potentially getting out. And Removing the barrier to entry, right? If you have a yeah. good name now, that name will follow you. Yeah, and, and I would say, honestly, just a, a relative grit. You just need to be able to say, and we see this too. I mean, we've instructed boot camps is effectively mm -hmm. what they are. In the civilian world, a boot camp prepares you for an exam, which you've theoretically studied for, for anywhere between four to 12 months, depending on the examination, mm -hmm. which is a final check. Uh, the way I see a lot of service members approach it is this is the only way and time that I can dedicate to take an examination. But that's not true. There's YouTube, yeah. there's Coursera, there's LinkedIn Learning. You have every resource available to you. Free you to have. To, it's mm -hmm. totally free. You mm -hmm. just have to be able to be um, intelligent enough and uh, introspective enough to say, I am spending uh, four to six hours on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever per day. Mm -hmm. What if you just went and focused and did a deep flow state and just studied something for the sake of studying it? Just challenge yourself. Uh, and, and so, kind of like coming out of the military, I, I got a, a res, kind of a newfound respect for little things like uh, EIB, where you expert infantry badge, where you had to prepare in, ahead of time, and then you had a 30 day examination, and then you were awarded a badge or things that required preparation ahead of time. Uh, because you still have that same glide path, but when you're a civilian, there's expectations. You can, you can be retained and you could also be let go. So there's performance metrics. And so you have to hit wickets and it's in the military. If you don't perform, okay, you get a substandard, substandard NCOER, but you look in your paycheck and you still get a uh, defense yeah. check twice. Yeah. A month. So no KPIs when you're active duty. <laughs> no, no, your KPI is maintaining a pulse and passing yeah. the ECFT. And if you can do that, your superstar retainability is great. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and that's the thing, man. Uh, you know, coming up, because I came in at Signal, 
like right when I was 18. And my first deployment, I realized I was worthless to my team because I knew nothing and I refused to learn. You know, I was, I had dreams of being a firefighter when I got out. IT was foreign to me. So after that, all I did was go on CBT Nuggets. And all of a sudden, just from learning CCNA, I became like this all-star in my section, which I wasn't. Yeah, I didn't know anything still, but you know more than the next guy that yeah. doesn't study at all. So I think you're right in that the IT is a continuous process and it's a journey. It's not just, I got this cert, I'm done now. No, it's continuous and you always have to learn, train, learn your craft, learn new technology. And soldiers, they think they don't have time for that. But as you know, as a civilian in a high paying job, is there really that much time difference? You're still busy, right? No, and, and really even throughout skill bridge process, there are portions that I do perform that time management and figure out when to do my own tasks because I saw the shadow, I had a mentorship program, but I also had to know the technology at a very high level at an expedited rate. So it was 15 minutes here, 30 minutes here. You're never gonna get a six hour straight unless you've coordinated and set it up on your own so that you do six hours dedicated every day. Um, that's not gonna happen. You find time where you can get it and then you make it happen. And if you have a family, it's even harder. Yeah. So it's not easy. You just have to make the best with what you have and that's life. But if you want that high six figures, it's what you have to do. Yeah, but you also need to make sure that if you're going for that high six figures, one, know what you actually want. Um, know what you want to do because having a high paying six figure job is great, but I work or I know a few friends that have separated that have that high six figure job and they're still not happy. So uh, there's a lot of introspection that needs to happen when you get out of the service um, and you need to be really well set up mentally for that separation. I mean, you just got out. Uh, you had a great glide path. You had a plan. You had a business. Uh, was it easy? Yeah, no, um, th I'm glad you said that because we're about to segue into the emotional part of the transition. No, and even though the unit we came from, we had a lot of freedom, there still was that day to day that I knew I had to do. And now that I've transitioned and during that period where I just kind of was in limbo, and they say it happens to every veteran, uh, you kind of don't, you just feel a little lost. You, yep. you leave all your friends again because you left all your friends when you joined, you know. And now you're just on your own with no NCO checking up on you with no support system, unless your company culture has that. Right. But even then right. it's not the same. It just no. isn't. And I think the emotional transition sometimes is harder in our career field than the actual job, job transition. Cause we can do these things. We can get our certs. We can have clearances. We can network, we can go on LinkedIn. We can study that's within our control. But sometimes our emotions feel out of our control. Sometimes, right? Yeah. And I think that's the hardest part of transition. So as you got out, what emotions were involved with leaving the military for potentially bigger and better things? And do you look at it as bigger and better things? Uh, so if anyone is getting out and doesn't have a sense of fear, or anxiety, or um, hesitation, then they're probably... Uh, probably lying to themselves or they have absolutely no plan and they haven't gone through any kind of COA dev. Like at a baseline, COA dev still exists coming out of the military. You just have a different name for it. Uh, so there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, you know, you're leaving, a, in my case, a, a pretty sizable reenlistment bonus, but being a Green Beret is a lot of service, a lot of soldiers' dreams and even people from out other branches. Um, I was leaving a great career field. I had a great career trajectory. Like I was fast-tracked on everything. I had everything that the board wanted on paper, um, you know, deploying seven times. You're like, I can face anything. But the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, the fear of having a paycheck come in on a consistent basis, right? Like, what is my career trajectory growth look like? There's no army uh, career tracker online where you can go hit an Excel spreadsheet and it says you will do this, this and this within a seven year plan. You're guaranteed a retirement it doesn't exist. Uh, it's scary. It's frightening. Uh, you have a lot of imposter syndrome. You'll hear that a lot coming out because you're working with, in my case, you know, double, triple, quadruple CCIEs <laughs> been in the industry for 20, sometimes 30 years. Yeah. Now you're coming in and the invitation you got to sit at the same table was you served in the military, right? Like 
in many in many respects, I feel like you have to perform even more to gain that respect and that trust and confidence by your peers. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it's it's completely terrifying. Um, it, whether you're using journaling, therapy, uh, reading, um, you know, yes to all three for me. Yeah. Uh, and then it's, uh, <laughs> like, it takes a lot of work, but you really need to do your due diligence and put it down on paper. Who are you? And then you layer that onion. And as you get the layers on, maybe you've done 20, 30 years as an infantry soldier. That doesn't preclude you from doing IT. That doesn't mean you can't go work in investment banking. You just need to figure out what do you actually like to do? And then forget what your MOS was. How do I get to that next step? And you have to look at that next ridge line. And that's the hard part when you are melting down internally about this career pr transition. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you with that imposter syndrome because think about it, the industry you're in, being a systems architect at Cisco, while your peers were in industry, you might have been sleeping in the woods. And that well, is something I think about. I'm like, you know what? Like, even though I had deployments where I did network engineer work, when I was stateside, it wasn't always like that. You know, I was doing soldier stuff. So is my eight years of experience, eight years of experience, and that's something you're going to feel, right? Um, so I agree with you, the emotional part of it, especially that imposter syndrome, people just in IT have it in general, but coming out of the military and jumping right into the private sector, yep. that can be uh, <laughs> very nerve wracking and you yep. definitely will have anxiety about it. And I think that's why a lot of soldiers sometimes stay with duty contracting, but, and, and, you know, I get it because it's what you're comfortable with. It's still that environment. Now, you work totally private sector, commercial side. If you had to name a few differences that you are, a few things about the culture that are different between that and the military, what would they be? Uh, so it's going to be the classic IT statement of it depends. So it really depends what you're aligned to. If you are aligned to a very risk averse, um, process driven, change management board heavy, very siloed uh, efforts of work. It's gonna be just like being in the in public sector, working on the Fed space, contracting, DOD, whatever. Um, if you're with a very code driven API centric, does everything on the cutting edge, uh, willing to take a little bit of risk for that little margin of benefit that they may get. And if, and if it doesn't work out, they're more than willing to roll back as long as business operations maintain, you can have that too. Uh, I think that's what's difficult with the private sector, though, is now you are not as uh, it's not as cohesive or as, as seamless as a uh, career progression. And your diversity is so much higher than it was in the military that you have so many variables that you have to balance. And it's that emotional intelligence. They call it EQ. That's really, really uh, required to be, to be able to work at a very high level in the private sector. In public sector, um, if if all else fails, you can talk about war stories and basic training stories, and then that usually kind of settles the playing field and people will normally hire you based off of your background. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you're a JSOC guy, you're leaving JSOC, you maintain a TSSCI and people don't mind working with you, it's real easy to just go work at JSOC as a contractor again, or use yeah. SOC, or NSW, or wherever you work, uh, ForceCom, mm -hmm. like, you can do whatever you want. Oh, yeah, and it's going to be the same predictable stuff you had before, and it's a real easy progression. And you know what? It's not a bad stepping stone if you decide to take that route. Yeah, I agree. And because, uh, you know, when you're getting out, those recruiters hit you up all the time, like TSSCI, JSOC experience. Do this simple interview, come work for us, right? So definitely in our case, that is true. Now, leaving soft. You were soft most of your career. Yep. Was there any lessons you learned from soft that help you in the private sector? Any sort of mindset, any of the, maybe the soft truths that do help you? Yeah, uh, humans definitely are more important than hardware. That's number one. But two, it's kind of funny, special forces in the name, but what you learn in the title is there's nothing special about special operations or you as a service member. You are just capable of doing uh, unique uh, interdisciplinary things with a higher level of trust, but you're not special. You just have more trust and confidence by your chain of command. That's it. That's the only difference. 
Uh, I wake and put my pants on just like a private in the 82nd or in the 101st. There's zero difference. I can just ruck and run faster with a heavier pack. And at one point I went through some gates and wickets, but at the end of the day, you're not special and there's always someone bigger, better and faster than you. Um, I think going through the service and understanding that I had unique values and characteristics that I could bring to the table, but there was nothing uh, better about me compared to the guy on my left or right. Each of us had our different strengths and weaknesses. It's just how did I plan and utilize and leverage those in order to make whatever end state I was trying to do. I really took that from my service. Um, and honestly, doing the best with what you have. So if your equipment's broken, your training schedule sucks, and uh, you have no funding, y yada, 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 uh, you still got to make it happen. So mm -hmm. as long as you do it legally, ethically, or if you don't do it that way and you don't get caught, even better, um, <laughs> did you make mission happen? And that's yeah. all anyone cares about. A message to Garcia, right? But, yeah, you gotta carry that message. Yeah, you gotta get it into the jungle. <laughs> but I agree with you. And even being a business owner, like tech startup, that's really what I take from the culture is I always just have to make the mission happen. And I'm still doing that with my company. And now with you at Cisco being a systems architect, I'm sure a lot of that same mentality comes with it. Hey, we gotta get this customer. We're gonna make it happen no matter what. And having that mentality, no, it's not unique to SOP, but it is something that I think they teach us a lot. Yeah. So I think soldiers exiting from soft, not necessarily are more well equipped, but if you take in what you're learning from your mentors and peers, then you are well equipped to exit the military and have a good transition. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would say that um, special operations or soft, I think uh, typically as a command climate that is more favorable towards uh, permitting skill bridges and Mm -hmm. These kind of internship possibilities, um, SOCOM has another one that is completely separate from the SkillBridge DOD program. There's a lot of venues and avenues for that. Um, that's not saying SOF is better. It's just these are offered by proxy of going through and assessing for a different unit, and that's just the way it is. Uh, but mm -hmm. even uh, some of the best people I've transitioned with came from the conventional force and just had a really good head on their shoulders about what they wanted to do and kind of what they were about. Uh, what I see a lot with more motivated too, huh? Yeah. Well, what I see with some special <laughs> operations guys is um, an expectation that something is due to them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll be the first to say that, like uh, having Green Brain in your title does help sometimes for an application or interview, but you still got to deliver. And I would say of the people that I've interviewed with or spoke to, only ten percent knew what a Green Brain was. Um, <laughs> It doesn't really yeah. matter. You say special operations, JSOC, SOCOM, whatever acronym soup you want, your average interviewer doesn't care. Mm. It's they, I mean, even moving back to the West Coast, Arizona, there's no military bases here. So yeah. you say you're in the military? I was like, yeah, I was in the Army. They're like, oh, like my cousin's Marine. That's so cool. Like they, they don't know. They're just like, oh. they're like, what'd you do? I was like, I did IT. They're just like, oh, there's IT in the Army? <laughs> so. Yep. Again, transitioning to that private sector, those are the hurdles you have to maneuver. Because like you, we talked about earlier, you have to prove yourself. You have to say, no, I've done this. And I've been on interviews too, Keenan, where on my resume is the same technology as the private sector uses. System, right. DMVPN, FlexVPN. So I, I could go off and list it. But when it says 112 Signal Battalion or JCU, my interviewer is like, where does work? Oh, just the Army. Yeah. You know, and they don't know. So, no. segueing into our last talking point. So, I have three things I want to go over with you. So, okay. for our students, our clients, I feel like there's this base. We have a 25 Bravo that probably has been doing help desk for like four to five years. They have decent IT experience, maybe a couple of deployments. Then we might have a 25 series that's like a radio operator that's mm -hmm. just touched Harris radios that now is getting out and he's freaking out. He or she's freaking out like, I don't know IT, what am I gonna do? Yeah. And then we have just the cook or the infantry guy. So let's start with the first one, that 25 Bravo. Okay. How what advice do you have for that 25 Bravo with legit experience getting out and getting that six figure job? Let's say they wanna get into cloud or cybersecurity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, depending on the route you wanna go on, if they don't have security plus already, just get security plus. 
worst case scenario, and I tell this to everyone, is be 8570 compliant. So you got something on your pace plan. 8570 compliant for the guys listening, guys and gals listening in, it at least allows you to work in the, in the Fed space as a systems admin. So great, great, great opportunity. I love that certification. It's a good entryway into the career field. Uh, what I see a lot is people will go full send on it. So for that 25 Bravo that has life experience and has real world experience and has maybe that certification, do an entry level security cert, do an entry level site or cloud cert, and then from there, determine what route you want to pick and be exceptional at it. If you want to blend it up and be a cyber security practitioner in cloud instances, great. But at least get the stepping stones. Uh, I work with a lot of people that'll ask, what cert gets me the most money? Should not be the approach you take. It is what is going to the cert I am going to enjoy doing day to day. So for the experience 25 Bravo, I would recommend picking the certification that you can see yourself doing day to day and enjoying. And if you enjoy it, the money is going to come. Just let the money happen. I promise you the money is out there. Just be exceptional at something and pick it. Mm -hmm. Now, what and about your experience doesn't programs. translate one for one? Yeah, I agree with you. Now, what about what programs you think on the transition now they should look into? We kind of talked about it already, but Skillbridge, right? Yeah. Uh, that's like DOD heroes, hiring heroes, something like that. Yeah. There's so, a lot of programs. Yeah, and honestly, it's it's a saturated market. So, uh, I did Special Operations Transition Foundation, SODIF. Uh, there's a couple others out there. There's the Honor Foundation, Hire Our Heroes, uh, Commit. It depends on what you're looking for. If you're more introspective and want to learn about yourself a little bit more, this is a lot of the time I see it for the senior service members coming out. Uh, SODIF, the Honor Foundation, and Commit are really great at figuring out who you are as a person. Uh, if you want to get a job, uh, Hire Our Heroes is great. Um, and each one of these is going to prepare you for it, but I strongly encourage anyone that can is there's really three programs that are available out there. One is your skill bridge, and I know services are starting to reduce the time allowed. Uh, there's another mm -hmm. venue if you're in special operations where SOCOM will let you actually go through and do your own skill bridge that is not within the skill bridge program. So it's an internship. It's totally mm -hmm. separate. And then there's also one for wounded warriors. So. Wounded Warriors isn't just like you got injured in combat. Were you injured in training? Were you injured uh, just in daily operations? And so you can absolutely take that as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's my students, the biggest thing I tell them, because there's opportunities out there. Even if you have certs, you don't maybe have a network, but there's these programs. There's a skill yep. bridge. I always bring up Cisco Missiles program too. Uh, I think Microsoft has an academy that yep. soldiers can go into, MSSA. So You're there's a well, your 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 Azure certs are totally free uh, from mm -hmm. a service member coming out. Uh, you get 12 months free of LinkedIn Premium, which is huge. That's almost $50 a month free. Syracuse <laughs> runs an on <laughs> an offboarding program called Onward to Opportunity O2O. Every major installation has it. Syracuse effectively gives you a boot camp for high yield certification, project management, uh, CASP, CISSP. There's a lot of great stuff there, and also. Shout out to the trades. There's some great trade opportunities too. Maybe you mm -hmm. don't want to go use your GI Bill. If you want to go work in the trades, there's even more trade opportunities provided where you yep. can get your HVAC, electrician, plumbing, all those certifications before you even get out of the cell tower. Hey, that's good money. Yep. <laughs> yep. One of our buddies from JCU is actually doing that. Yep. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Now, that radio operator that doesn't have any experience. Yep. I always tell them, like, you just need to do some labs. You need to start learning IT. And essentially, their pass is the same as the 25 Bravo, but they just got to do a little bit extra. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. And just be okay with having uh, information technology specialist in your resume, but not necessarily having the experience to go with it. This may just be one of those things where you got to be 8570 compliant and pay your dues for a little bit and just really figure out the industry. Uh, but there's still certification tracks, and as long as you are a solid performer and uh, someone of high level of intelligence that is motivated, people, depending on who you actually interact with, especially during your your, intern, your uh, interviews, they may take that risk and say, you know what, you don't have 30 years of experience, and this happened to me, 
you don't have the experience, but you have something else, and we're willing to take the risk and the gamble to get you where you need to be. And as long as you are a good human being and you're willing to put in the work, people will put in the work to help you get there. So that's what I would say to the uh, service member that doesn't necessarily have the experience or certifications. And I don't think that should slow them down either. I think no. like one of my good buddies, he's going to come on this podcast as well. He did five years Seaburn, yep. right? And Seaburn, I mean, <laughs> you know, here's your gas mask. Yeah, right? and then, yeah, and then they play FIFA the rest of the time in the office. So he got out. He got a set plus, got a CC name, just grinded learning, sent well, out resume after resume, but he got hired as a network admin, which I think is rare because usually your first job in IT is help desk, tier one support, service support. But he started in networking, 90 grand a year. One year later, was working at NASA making 140 a year, right? Okay. And he didn't have a TSSCI, just a secret clearance. And it's just putting in that work and that effort because you, you had that something else. People want to work with him. Yeah. Now. Or want to teach you. I, I, mean, I worked yeah. with a forklift driver in Iraq that uh, he's a forklift driver. In, uh, actually, he was a forklift driver in Afghanistan first. Uh, four years later, expressed interest in doing uh, route switch. Never touched it before. Mm -hmm. They taught him after hours, took CCNA on his own, took a bunch of server certifications and VMware certifications on his own. CCMP on his own and was really in charge for of an entire theater uh, with no experience outside of just grinding while deployed as a contractor. Mm -hmm. Started off with an unclass, then a secret, then a TS clearance. So mm -hmm. anything's possible. I, I agree with you. And I think for a lot of our students, you know, they're Gen Z, kind of like me. And uh, I think that's the hardest thing too, is getting them to understand that it is a journey. You have to study a one week boot camp does not put you in the situation to go be a network engineer. It just doesn't. It's, and like you said earlier, it's an hour, two hours a day. It's really not that much, right? Yeah. An hour a day, just simple studying. And then all of a sudden it becomes a habit. And then that habit grows into you being disciplined. And then it grows into you being the man or girl at your job that is that man, right? We're gonna yeah. go ask him or her how we do this. So last perspective, and then we can kind of uh, settle, you know, settle down here. We've been talking a long time, but <laughs> um, is that infantry guy or that cook? Now we know what they need to do as a person, right? But yep. actual like hands-on keyboard, what do you recommend? Start CBT Nuggets, Udemy, YouTube. What resources do they sit down at the computer and they start Googling? What do you suggest? Yeah, whatever's free. So study whatever is free. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can you can take net plus sec plus casp ccna you can get bulk of these classes for free i know you offer a lot of the products and uh viewership on youtube for a lot of that self-study you can do a self-study and there's a lot of initiatives to get that self-study out there for people no cost so your buy-in should be zero figure out what you want to do and put in the hours you know as any service member it doesn't matter if you're infantry special operations a cook uh an admin clerk you still get Army Cool or whatever your credentialing and tuition assistance program is from your service. So use it. Like if you aren't actively consuming that four thousand dollars per year, uh, you're you're just completely wasting away all of the benefits that you're being given on top of your healthcare and everything else. Yeah. Take the free courses, and then from there go on Cool. Uh, you know Army certifications. Uh, it has everything on Ignite ED. Uh, you can see everything that's out there. Go ahead and start selecting a la carte. Uh, Trepa's on there. You got non-Trepa products out there. Everyone has a certification boot camp and uh, process out there on Ignite ED, and I'm, each service has the same. Use the free resources, and then yeah. from there, you're going to be fine. Just give yourself some time. If you are that infantryman, cook, or clerk, and you're like, I get out in six weeks, well, hey, man, hope's not a COA. So <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to figure it out real fast. But yeah. If you're listening to this and you have six months, six to 12 months out, it's going to be fine. Yeah. Take your time, do the free stuff, get a couple certifications. And uh, if you don't already have your, your, your headshot and your resume completed, it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Some expectation management, some savings. So if you got that Hellcat or Dodge Charger, like, hey, scat pack, baby, sell it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's gas is expensive and no one's going to pay your mortgage when you're when you're out of the service so yep. uh do your due diligence give yourself some time and breathing space it's okay to have a low grade freak out 
get your uh, LinkedIn network moving forward, but take the free certifications first. Yeah. There's I, tons of stuff out there. I think LinkedIn, I'm going to backtrack on what you said about the free. Um, LinkedIn too, there's no barrier to entry. I mean, no. I know guys that are posting about uh, layer one, like they're like, oh, I learned about cables. Right. They get 200 likes on it. It's because in IT, this is how it should be and how it mainly is, we're open. Gatekeepers in IT don't last long, and it's like, hey, come learn. Let's all come up together. Let's all learn together. If you're starting at the help desk, there's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, that is fun. Where you. I started. You know, yeah. But I, you will. You got to be vulnerable. Uh, mm -hmm. The best advice I got from my my uh, mentors during the Skillbridge process was be vulnerable and open. If you don't know, say you don't know, because that mm -hmm. is your opportunity to grow. Now, yeah. when you fail and you miss one of those KPIs, kind of a little too late. Why didn't you say you didn't know? So, yeah. I agree with you. It's, yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. You don't want to miss the performance. Just say it, you know? Yep. And as far as the free training, that's how I started. You know, when I started at the help desk, I couldn't really find anything online that was like, teach me help desk. There was like Active Directory courses or stuff like that. And I was like, okay, like what's CCNA? I just went on YouTube. I started studying CCNA. And then once I got to the point where it was time to test, then I maybe paid for uh, practice exams. Right. Then I paid for CBT nuggets proper. So the barrier to entry into IT is free. I don't think you need to start spending until you really like dial down on what it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. And you may need that paid resource because as good as free is, it's free. Yep. People that say they just watched Professor Messer and they passed, maybe, but more than likely, they paid for practice exams more than likely they paid for some sort of resource and you got to pay for the exam but yep. the great thing about being in the military you get all that for free actually for free right you yep. can go on army ignited like you said e but e to get started free go on youtube yeah cloud cyber I mean, it if you want to go study for cloud plus this is pearson views book mm -hmm. depending where you buy it it's anywhere between 20 and 40 dollars so Kindle are like $9. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you're willing to go buy a log of dip to go to the field, but you're unwilling to go buy a study reference, then, you know, that's your personal decision. But those barriers and entries really aren't that high. Uh, I think it's kind of like your value set in the service. If you really prioritize the blingy watch, the blingy car, but you don't put that investment into yourself, it's going to reflect when you come out. Oh, yeah. And then people, I see it a lot, man, of our customers, they panic. And it's yep. like, well, that's fine. We're here now. You're panicking. We'll get through it. But you got to prepare. And I think, from at least from personal experience, day one, getting to my unit, the 112th, once I kind of learned, like, oh, what is IT? Everything I did was prepared to get out. Because it don't matter if you're doing 20 or 30 years. There's only one thing in life that's truly going to happen. You get out of the military. And of course, death and taxes, those are going to happen to you. But, yeah, you know, it, yeah, it, no matter who you are, even if you're Sergeant Major, guess what? You're still at the Social Support Center with me, Staff Sergeant Bannon. And we're looking at each other like this hey, uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. So I think everyone should be taking steps to prepare to get out. It doesn't matter where you are in your career, because that transition will happen and you want to be set up. Just peace of mind. I mean, just so you have a good life. Yeah. yeah and your family. You, you're not, you're, you're planning right. an exit strategy for you. And if you're married with kids, uh, their lifestyles, their futures, their healthcare, everything. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff that goes into play, but you know, just like you're saying, when you, when you go into the soldier support center, at Fort Liberty, uh, formerly Fort Bragg, <laughs> and you see that line of people, you got everything from the most eight up E3 game chaptered to the senior E9 with 12 combat deployments and the common denominator amongst that entire line of people getting their DD-214s is most of them don't know what the hell they're going to do. They just know yeah. they're going to get out. Yep. And, and, it's, and it's almost sad because it's unceremonious. Here you go, Sergeant Major, here's your DD-214. Yep. Then you kick rocks. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's no, that music doesn't play in the background. There's no fireworks. You get a DD-214. Nope. If you retired, you get a flag, a Soldier for Life sticker, and uh, a lapel pin. And uh, yeah. uh, one of your instructors, our good friend, mutual good friend, just got out on medical retirement. They were out of it. So he just got a flag and a DD-214 and a certificate. <laughs> and I think his cert actually had his name spelled wrong. So 
You get that. And that civilian, that civilian at the desk is like, all right, get out of my office. We close at four. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I got lunch from 1130 to 1300. If you're here at 1131, get out of my face. The doors are locked. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's no ceremony, well, man. man. You, yeah. you get out of that stupid parking lot. Uh, if you go in uniform, you got your beret, you look at it and you're like, well, shoot, what's next? I got to go pack yeah. my belongings because I'm moving across the country. And that's your yeah. space. Yeah. Hey, I don't want to talk in circles no more, Keenan, but I appreciate all the advice, man. I, uh, we're going to cut this up and edit it, and hopefully I see your face across my feed one day. Not from me. <laughs> well, absolutely. No, it was a pleasure talking to you, Johnny. And uh, yeah. for anyone watching this, if you uh, have any questions, please feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Always happy to connect and uh, help shape, guide, or mentor if you need anything at all. This isn't like a pitch for a cost or a service. Uh, I love helping veterans. Uh, I don't care if you're soft or not. And just let me know how I can be a service to help you guys out. So thanks, Johnny. Then after the first hour, you charge what a thousand? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we don't talk about that. It's a buy-in. I got it. Might start yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I didn't want to fuck up your game. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Keenan.